So, uh, first question for you. How does your current work relate to your earlier work on economics? Um, okay, well, um, <clears throat> maybe I should uh, start with my uh, college career. And um, I started um, as a student in philosophy. Um, uh, but I, uh, I, I abandoned that after a year or two. I forget the details. But I was not satisfied uh, with it. And I, as I recall, um, <coughs> I, I once had a um, colloquy with a, a philosopher over here, and um, I mentioned that um, I thought uh, philosophy was uh, kind of empty. And uh, he said, well, you obviously have no vacation, vocation for that. So anyway, and for one reason or another, I uh, uh, dropped philosophy and majored in international relations, which was my uh, ultimate major. And the reason for doing that was not I was so interested in that, but it was not a regular curricular subject, which means you had a lot, a lot of freedom for what courses you uh, you took, and I took very many courses then in uh, government and economics, uh, even a course in education, as I recall, history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was what I graduated in, and then uh, uh, I won a. Um, fellowship to the so-called Alvin Johnson, uh, well, an Alvin Johnson scholarship to the New School for Social Research, uh, where I uh, stayed uh, one year. And uh, I decided to uh, major in economics because I had a talent for mathematics, and economics was the most uh, mathematical of the subjects, so I figured I would do well. In other words, I didn't have any particular burning desire to become an economist, but it looked like that was a good field uh, for me to be in, in general. And um, I'm not quite sure it worked out that way, but uh, I certainly uh, did utilize mathematics. Uh, math, uh, economics was becoming quite mathematical uh, during that period, uh, mainly due to uh, the influence of Paul Samuelson, although, of course, there was an underlying uh, tendency uh, for that to occur. Uh, if you read economics of the uh, 1930s, you find it's almost all uh, verbal mm. and uh, quite ambiguous as to uh, what is what it's saying. So mathematics was needed to uh, pin things down. And uh, you know, even those, those aspects of um, the subject which were uh, called mathematical, like uh, business cycle theory, uh, stuff like that there, uh, was not done too well by mm. economists uh, who did not have a big grasp of the subject. And Samuelson intervened here and said the relationship between uh, Hicksian, um, uh, uh, you know, what would it be? Let's say Hicksian macroeconomics, mm. uh, Hick, John Hicks being uh, one of the major uh, theories, and true dynamic uh, stability, oh, uh, stability uh, a la Hicks versus true dynamic stability as defined by mathematicians. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there were, there were things that he corrected, and uh, there was a general tendency for people who knew math and uh, who could apply it to uh, get elevated. Mm -hmm. And I should mention that um, I think it was the graduate record exam or something of that sort uh, where uh, I, I took a test of uh, proficiency in it, and you could choose your subject. Being an econ major, you would think that most, uh, most would uh, choose economics, but I chose mathematics as, a, um, as <clears throat> my uh, uh, test uh, thing and uh, aced it, essentially. Mm -hmm. I think I got almost a perfect score on it. So that was considered a great feat in the economics department. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and uh, I would say um, my orientation toward economics was in that direction. The idea was that a good economics paper is one that is mathematically sound, whatever that's supposed to mean. And uh, also, uh, of course, uh, tries, tries to capture something of uh, importance uh, and pos possible applications and so forth and so on. So I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, <laughs> Well, let's where, see. where I was. Now, what, what I see now is a certain narrowness 
and the overall uh, point of view. I mean, economics has a, um, I, I would d describe the general uh, tendency as assuming rationality. In other words, you have a, people recognize a set of possibilities that they can do, like mm -hmm. uh, having a certain amount of money that you can spend on different consumer items if you're a consumer, or uh, having a uh, technology set, a set of things you can do if you're uh, a firm transforming one particular collection of uh, matter into a more valuable collection of matter. And um, so that, that, that's your, um, your choice set, so to speak. And you also have a utility function. Uh, in the case of, um, econ in the case of uh, consumers, uh, that's supposed to be a, um, represented by a preference order over consumer bundles. In other words, the set of possible consumer bundles that you can take, uh, 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 you, you do, and you, uh, you choose the one that has the highest utility. In other words, the highest degree of preference according to your tastes. Uh, economics in general at that time did not try to delve into why people had these tastes rather than others. Okay, so that's, that's one half. On the other hand, you have firms who, of course, are also run by people, but for some reason or other, they have quite different preferences when they're uh, <coughs> running firms. And the preferences there are for... Uh, maximum profits. Hmm. Now that itself is an ambiguous term because uh, things are distributed over time. So a particular income stream versus another income stream, you have to figure out which is the bigger one. And that involves things like uh, rates of return, interest rates, and so forth and so on. And uh, there's also the problem of uncertainty. Uh, <clears throat> when I was uh, first going into economics, the whole idea of quantifying uncertainty was new, I would say. You know, people talked about, um, you know, uncertainty causing business cycles and so forth, but there was no coherent theory. But again, the concept of, um, of expected utility came in here. Uh, um, well, I, I won't try to get into the uh, details of that, but um, the way... Uh, the way that was indicated, an expected utility means you have a certain probability distribution over the possible outcomes, and uh, you have a overall utility function, which is different in, for different outcomes, and um, you want to maximize the expected value in the probability sense of that utility. Um, for that, th th there's a problem also in utility because the, the concept of utility is just a preference order and you could stretch and, and, and squeeze it and so forth and so on. As long as the order is maintained, you come up with the same result. When you introduce probability, you're much more restricted. You have what has to be called an infid uh, a, uh, <laughs> a, um, uh, interval uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, utility function, that is to say, you cannot stretch it arbitrarily. You can multiply it by a constant, and you can add a constant. And uh, that's, that's the limited range. Otherwise, you get inconsistency with the concept of utility, of uh, expected utility. OK, so what does all this have to do with my um, preferences here? Um, all right, OK, so the, what I defined is basically what is called rational behavior. Right. And rational behavior also typically would include the idea of self-interest. It doesn't have to. I mean, you, you, you can have a saint having rational behavior. Let's say, how can I do the most good for the universe? Mm -hmm. And uh, you could order that. But uh, in economics, you don't do that because it's assumed to be unrealistic. People are uh, self-interested. You have a little problem with families. Uh, and uh, you know you might want to uh, uh, include other people in your utility function uh, as uh, people you like, and incidentally, you could also include people you hate, although that's much less uh, studied in uh, economics. You mean wanting to do them harm? I beg your pardon. You mean wanting to do them harm? That's right. Okay. 
the, you minimize the utility, so to speak. <laughs> yes. uh, if you can do it at not too great cost to yourself. And, um, okay, uh, so I, I also began to uh, study the other social sciences and also use my common sense on what's happening in the world to indicate that uh, this is not a very good description of most human behavior. Well, it, is this uh, before or after your, your first book? Is this in the Oh, well, that... m m much before my first book. So, um, I mean, e even when I was, uh, as a graduate student, mm -hmm. I was beginning to uh, have a few doubts. Mm -hmm. um, although my dissertation was in this, this, uh, this uh, general tradition. And, um, but, yeah, I began reading in the other social sciences, I say, uh, who uh, were very, uh, very dubious about the idea of rational conduct and in fact there were um, lots of lots of uh, shall we say criticism of economic theory and uh, on the other hand the econ economists thought that uh, economics was the king of the social sciences mm -hmm. and in fact other some other social sciences uh, borrowed from economics wholesale in particular political science in other words, you think of politicians as also maximizing their utility, which may involve the probability of being re-elected, something like that. You have a uh, special theory for uh, government bureaucrats, supposed that that's supposed to be to maximize their budget, to, just to give you an example of what's going on. And um, so, so that was it. On the other hand, um, you could say that uh, sociologists and uh, anthropologists took a much broader view of that. You know, e you have economics in that, certainly, economic anthropology, economic sociology, but there's lots that don't fit in. The concept of culture is a couple of steps removed. Uh, in other words, people might do things out of habit or out of custom, or because they would be punished by uh, the powers that be, or because of their own conscience. Conscience does not enter into economic theory as a rule. <laughs> so, um, yeah, even though I, I should mention uh, parenthetically that uh, Adam Smith's uh, second book was all about conscience, <laughs> the, uh, the theory of moral sentiments. Sure. And um, so that, that was the broadening thing. And uh, I, what I wanted to do was to get something which um, transcended the specialization that each of us has. I mean, economists had this particular narrow point of view, but also the other sciences, uh, social sciences had this narrow point of view. Uh, physics had a certain point of view. They were experts in, in one uh, area too. And uh, you want something that covers this range and integrates it and coheres it in some sense or other. Traditionally, this is supposed to be done by philosophy. You know, philosophy is the queen of all of uh, human knowledge, perhaps, in some sense. Unfortunately, the philosophers of the 20th and 21st century do not measure up to that. Well, I don't, do you really want to make a broad statement about all of them like that? <laughs> no, I don't want to. I, I, I think there are some very good philosophers but I would say the best ones are those who have made themselves experts in some particular field and apply general philosophical con uh, uh, concepts to that. For example, how do you know that? You're supposed to be a skeptic if you're a, uh, a philosopher and you delve into the epistemology of that particular area, epistemology of biology, of uh, sociology, and so forth and so on. So philosophers, they have made very important contributions on the other hand, uh, you know, I could talk about lots of schools of uh, philosophy, which basically are beside the point. I guess one thing I'm taking from this is that all the seeds of your current thought have actually been there quite a while. So mm -hmm. even though you had that book that was very mathematical and I guess focused very heavily in economics, you've always had these broad interests, or you've had these broad interests for a very yeah, long well, time. Yeah, well, you know, at that point, I had these broader interests, but I could not articulate it in, um, in a book form. Hmm. I mean, for one thing, my dissertation, of course, had to be standard economics, and the book itself grew out of that. Maybe hmm. uh, 
multiplying it by a factor of seven or so. And um, so it had to be of that form. But, but I, you know, I mean, even in that book, I tried to uh, interpolate the, um, the mathematical part, which is, which is really quite difficult, actually, uh, with common sense statements. How does this apply to the real world? Or what kind of situations fit this particular uh, uh, model? So I, I made some effort in that direction. I think uh, a fairly good effort, I would guess, but uh, <laughs> yeah. still narrow, be, not, not because my interests were narrow, but because my mastery of subject matter was still narrow at that point. Oh, interesting.